this webcast lecture on Thomas Robert Malthus, an English economist whose work spans the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. Malthus's most famous and influential book is the essay concerning the principle of population, which was published in 1798. The thesis of the book is that there are natural limits to the growth of population, because as the population grows, the demand for food will outstrip the ability to produce it. This will cause starvation and various other economic f effects which will limit population growth. The book was a bestseller and had a tremendous impact on the intellectual climate of the 19th century in England. The Dickensian preoccupation with orphans and motherless and fatherless children, problems of inheritance, problems of overcrowding in slums are essentially Malthusian in their outlook and Malthus is an empiricist and he can be categorised in with the classical economists. He came after Adam Smith and was roughly a contemporary of Ricardo. As Smith and Ricardo did, he worked with data, analysing it, categorising it, trying to find laws. And for him, the law was that of population and what we would now call demographics, that economic phenomena, such as the rising and falling of prices and wages, had an underlying cause, which was the structure of the population. And he sets out his thesis pretty clearly right at the start of the book. He says that population, when unchecked, will grow in a geometrical ratio, but that subsistence for man will grow in an arithmetical ratio. And what do you mean by that is that um, if there's a man and a woman and they have say four children then and they have four children and so on and so on you get a ex rapid exponential growth but the means of supporting them the food supply housing can only grow in an arithmetical ratio it can maybe double so quite quickly you're going to get a situation where the population outstrips the means of subsistence now his point is not that population is checked by periodic famines although famine did take place. He's more interested in economic behaviour that anticipates the possibility of famine and the way that people adjust what they do to prevent famine. The book discusses the institution of marriage and how amongst rural people it was an institution for controlling and bringing into balance population growth with available farmland. So the, conventional, the convention was that the eldest son would not marry until he'd got his own farm. Now, at the end of the 18th century and the start of the 19th century, because of the process of enclosures, you, you now had far fewer fam small family farms. They'd been enclosed to produce big industrial farms in the big fields we see around the countryside today. You had a lot of uh, landless uh, pe uh, peasants who are now farm labourers and becoming factory labourers. Now, these people had no incentive to put off marriage and childbirth, and as a result of that, they were having larger families, Malthus noted. He also noted from what he knew of history and the data he could gather that um, population growth was checked by famine but not in quite the straightforward way you would imagine rather than this exponential growth in population truncated by sudden famines Malthus contends um, the poor the poor in particular have been subjected to what he calls oscillations when um, there'll be attempts to bring extra farmland uh, into cultivation marginal land will be brought in marshes will be drained and this will create actually a, a good you know, good times that's briefly uh, this doubling of capacity um, within a village or town but because they've drained the local swampland will uh, then prompt people using a sort of market mechanism to uh, increase the size of their families until such time as that new capacity is fully used up and then there'll be another sudden lurch forward. So when new land is brought into cultivation, wages rise, that leads to greater prosper prosperity. People will have more children, larger families, that will then place pressure on the land and there'll be another one of these periodic crises. So here we have a system that's very similar to Adam Smith's hidden hand of the market, um, very characteristic of the intellectual life of this time. Unusually for a classical economist, Malthus did not favour free trade and he was in favour of keeping the Corn Laws. Just to recap, the Corn Laws were import duties that prevented cheaper foreign corn being brought into England. Uh, English corn was very, very expensive, uh, partly because of the rising population and the supply and demand equation that would produce in Malthusian terms. Now, most uh, liberal economists wanted the Corn Laws to go, even though that would entail the ruin of British agriculture, so that people could buy... Um, cheap 
cheaper food on the world market, and this would allow the population to grow, would encourage economic growth and industrialization of the country. But that population growth was exactly what Malthus was worried about. So he deliberately wanted food to be expensive so that a market mechanism would prompt people to keep their families small and the population down and more in line with the capacity of the country to feed it. Likewise, Malthus was deeply opposed to the new poor law and the workhouses. Appalling though these places were, he was against any measure that would keep uh, the unemployed uh, uh, alive. Um, the, the only possible thing for the unemployed to do, Malthus thought, would be to emigrate and set up new colonies where they would reproduce this sort of um, uh, balance between uh, subsistence and population in the new colonies. The last thing you needed to do was have a poor law system that would keep the poor alive and encourage them to have more children. At one point in his writings, Malthus says, the poor law creates the poor that it maintains. And the 200 years or so since Malthus was writing, um, he's been very widely vilified and derided because, of course, the very large increase in world population, he predicted, did take place. But starvation is a thing unknown, um, at least in the developed world. There are still famines in Africa. So if you globally globalise his whole system, you could say that it's it's correct in that sense. Uh, there were famines throughout the uh, 19th, the first half of the 19th century, but the last mass famine in Europe took place in 1840, in the 1840s, uh, in Ireland, and that was that really had highly specific reasons to do with absentee landlordism and overdependence on one single food crop, the potato. So basically, it was a, a case of uh, Malthus had simply got it wrong on his main prediction that the population grew very, very considerably, but no, nobody was particularly well fed in the cities, the industrial cities, but no, there was no mass starvation, uh, as he predicted. Also, there was the intellectual critique that Malthus had failed to realise that each extra mouth was also an extra pair of hands and that, and that productivity could increase, including agricultural productivity, using technology on a scale that Malthus simply hadn't foreseen. Also, the widespread adoption of contraception in the 20th century particularly in association with the liberation of women from having a lot of children, has slowed down population growth to a point where in much of Western Europe it's just at the reproduction level. Couples, a man and a woman, will have two children and simply reproduce themselves. The average is somewhere between two and three, so the population growth is steady. Also, it's the case that... Uh, improved child mortality figures, the, the number of babies that survive in the early years, does not necessarily lead to a population boom because if, if parents know that their children are going to survive, they're very inclined to have fewer children and you can see that phenomena in the third world that as living standards go up population growth slows and that's particularly true when women are given rights because they want to have a life and not simply be constantly uh, giving birth to babies that then die in, in, in the in in the early years of their life. So all these economic, medical, uh, technological and sociological innovations that might vaguely be uh, grouped together as social democratic or at least modern uh, are a reason why Malthus's ideas went into abeyance. But more recently we've seen something like Malthusian ideas coming to the fore again in association with the Green Movement, the idea that economic growth um, has reached now its limits and that uh, starvation on a massive scale is back on the agenda unless the population is controlled, that we didn't solve the Malthusian dilemma in the 19th and 20th centuries by technology. We simply exported the problem to the third world and that by using agriculture, highly efficient agriculture, that's true, that produces a lot of uh, protein and carbohydrates, but it does so at the expense of a mechanised agriculture that's highly dependent on fossil fuels the use of which is creating the greenhouse problem and anyway the fossil fuels are going to go. A generation ago it would have seemed scarcely credible but it does seem that in the intellectual climate of the first decade of the 21st century that Thomas Robert Malthus and some of his ideas at least are coming back in from the intellectual cold.